Section 4. The Application and Usefulness of the Doctrine of Sin's Sinfulness. 1. In general, sin is the worst of the evils, the evil of evil, and indeed the only evil. Nothing is so evil as sin, nothing is evil but sin. As the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, so neither the sufferings of this life nor of that to come are worthy to be compared as evil with the evil of sin. No evil is displeasing to God or destructive to man, but the evil of sin. Sin is worse than affliction, than death, than devil, than hell. Affliction is not so afflictive, death is not so deadly, the devil not so devilish, hell not so hellish as sin is. This will help to fill up the charge against its sinfulness, especially as it is contrary to and against the good of man. The four evils I have just named are truly terrible, and from all of them everyone is ready to say, Good Lord, deliver us. Yet none of these, nor all of them together, are as bad as sin. Therefore our prayers should be more to be delivered from sin, and if God hear no prayer else, yet as to this we should say, we beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. 1. It is worse than any evil affliction. There are afflictions of several kinds, and they are all called evils. Is there any evil of any kind whatever, in the city, and I have not done it? Amos 3 6, says the Lord. You see that God will own himself the author of that evil, but not of sin, for that is a bastard begotten and bred by another. The evils of plagues and afflictions are brought by God, though deserved by sin. And now indeed no affliction seems to be joyous for the present, Hebrews 12 1, although they are not to be desired yet they may be endured. Sin on the contrary is neither to be desired nor endured. Any sin is worse than any suffering, one sin than all suffering, and the least sin than the greatest suffering. What then? Is sin worse than to be whipped, to be burnt or to be sawn asunder? Yes, by a great deal. It is clear from what our Saviour says, Fear not them that can kill but fear him that can damn, Matthew 10 28. That is, it is better to be killed than to be damned. You may more easily suffer from man than sin against God. One may suffer and not sin, but it is impossible to sin and not to suffer. They who avoid suffering by sinning, sin themselves into worse suffering. This seems to be clear enough. Yet the truth is so seldom properly applied until it is believed, and seldom believed until it is fully proved. I shall therefore demonstrate more fully that sin is worse than suffering. In general, this is so because sin is all evil, only evil, and always evil, which no affliction is or can be. In my flesh, says the apostle, no good dwells, not even the least, and this is ever present with me. Now it cannot be said of afflictions that there is no good in them, or that they are always present with us. There are some lucida intervala of bright intervals, some spells of sunshine in winter. We may say, it was good that I was afflicted the Psalm 11971, it is good to bear the yoke in one's youth, Lamentations 327. But one can never say, it was good that I sinned, no, though it were but in my youth, Ecclesiastes 11 9 and 12 1. All things may be corrected and made to work for our good, so that we can say not only that God who afflicted me was good, but that the affliction worked for good of 2 Corinthians 4.17, but we can never justly say that sin did us good. Many can say, Perissum nisi perissum, I would have perished had I not suffered, but no one can say, Periusum nisi percassum, oh I would have perished had I not sinned. No. It is by sin that we perish, and are undone. Many people have thanked God for affliction, but no one ever thanked him for sin. Some indeed misunderstand the meaning of Romans 6:17, as if the apostle were thanking God that men were sinners. But this is not the case by any means. He thanks God that they who once were sinners had become obedient to the gospel. The proper sense and reading of this text is, thanks be to God, though ye were the servants of sin in time past, yet and now ye have obeyed the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Or as it is in the margin and the Greek, whereunto ye were delivered. Sin, in itself, is good neither before nor after its commission, it is not good to be committed, nor good after it is committed. It does us no good, but hurt, all our days. Other evils, however, though we cannot call them good before, so that we might desire them, yet afterwards we can call them good and so we can thank God for them. I will illustrate this in detail. 1. Suffering may be the object of our choice, which sin cannot be. That which is evil and only evil cannot be the object of our volition and choice, it is against nature. 
If men did not call evil good and good evil, they could never love the evil nor hate the good. Nor may sin be chosen as a means to a good end, for as well as being evil and nothing else, it does evil and nothing else. Affliction on the contrary, though not chosen for itself, may yet be chosen for a good end, and chosen rather than sin. It may be chosen although the only good result were the avoidance of evil. We have examples of this, such as the three young men whose gallantry of spirit was such that though they should not be delivered by their God, yet they would not sin against their God or they were holily willful, nor even as much as demur. Deliberate or take time to consider whether they should suffer or sin, it was past dispute with them, brave and noble souls that they were Daniel 3.17. We find the same of Daniel himself at Daniel 6 and of St. Paul of Acts 20.24. Notice that when the Apostle speaks of his afflictions, he calls them light to 2 Corinthians 4.17, but when he speaks of sin, he speaks of it as a burden that pressed him down and made him cry out, wretch that I am. It made him groan, being burdened to 2 Corinthians 5.4. Moses' choice is famous the world over, for it was not made when he was a child, but when he came to forty years of age, he preferred suffering, not only before sinning but before honors, riches, and pleasures. He accounted the worst of Christ, namely, reproaches are better than the best the world could give. There is a further example which is more than all the rest, and it is that of our blessed Saviour. To him was the greatest offer made that ever was made, but though he was tempted, and suffered by being tempted, he scorned and abhorred to sin in Matthew 4. He endured the cross and despised the shame in Hebrews 12.1-4 he met the cross, shame and pain, and in addition the contradiction of sinners. Yes, all this he endured rather than sin. It is described as a striving against sin, Hebrews 12:4. And when Saint Peter wished him to decline suffering, he called him Satan, and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. Thus he teaches us that it is better to suffer than to sin. 2. We ought to rejoice in suffering. Not only should we choose suffering rather than sin, but we must do it with all joy, we must, in the highest degree, glory in tribulation. Sin on the contrary is the cause of shame and grief, not of joy. Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, James 1 2 not simply joy, or a little joy, but all joy, it is a reason for glorying. By temptations we are here to understand tribulations, for St. Paul says that temptations were for the trial of faith of Romans 5 3. The trial of faith is the furnace of affliction in Isaiah 48 10 with 1 Peter 1 6 and 7. Now if any were to glory in their sin, and pride themselves on that, they glory in their shame of Philippians 3.19. Indeed if we fall into sin it is a matter for grief and shame. Suffering is as far to be preferred before sin, as joy is before grief, and glory before shame. We may add that God himself takes pleasure, joy and delight in the trials of good men. Though he does not delight to grieve the children of men, yet he laughs at the trial of the innocent in Job 9.23, for in this sense this text is understood by many. God does not laugh at them as at the wicked, by way of derision and scorn, but by way of pleasure. It is as when a general in a war sends on a dangerous mission a company of men of whose courage and skill he is confident. Though he knows that some of them must bleed and perhaps die for it, yet it pleases him to see them engaged in it. Thus God laughs at the trial of the innocent, for he sees that they are men who can abide a trial, as the excellent expositor on the book of Job puts it, with much more to this effect. God takes pleasure in the sufferings of his people just as he did in the sufferings of Christ, and as Christ himself did. He boasted to the devil's face that Job still held fast his integrity, even though he were afflicted by the devil who had moved God against him, to destroy him without a cause of Job 2-3. One ingenious and eloquent commentator says on this text, Surely one may call Job more than happy since if, as David tells us, the man whose sins God is pleased to cover is happy, what may that man be accounted whose graces God vouchsafes to proclaim? We see then that God takes pleasure in and laughs at the trial of these his champions and heroes. The heathen moralist, Seneca, ventured to say that if there were any spectacle here below noble enough and worthy to entertain the eyes of God, it was that of a good man generously contending with ill-fortune, as they call it, afflictions and sufferings. But when men sin God laughs them to scorn. If his sons and daughters sin it provokes him to grief and anger, but the sins of others provoke him to laugh at and to hate them as Psalm 2 4 and 5, Psalm 37 13. Which is better? To suffer and please God or to sin and grieve him? To undergo that which by patient suffering of it will rejoice God and give him occasion to magnify us, 
or to do that which will provoke him to be angry with us, until we are consumed, and then to laugh at our calamity. Proverbs 1 26 and 27. 3. Many encouragements are given us to suffer, but none to sin. On the contrary there are all kinds of discouragements against sinning. It is all encouragement and no discouragement to suffering, but all discouragement and no encouragement to sin. For example, when we suffer for God, God suffers with us, but when we sin, God suffers by us. We read that in all their his peoples of affliction he was afflicted, he sympathized with them Isaiah 63 9, Hebrews 4 15. But when he speaks of sin, it is Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts 9 4 Saul's sin persecuted Christ Jesus. God complains of his people's iniquity as of a burden, as if they made a cart of God and loaded him with sins as with sheaves at Amos 2. When we suffer for God he has promised to help and assist us with counsel and comfort, with succor and support, but when we sin, God leaves us and withdraws his presence and consolations. If Jacob is in the fire or the water, God will be with him Isaiah 43 1 and 2. On the other hand God says, If ye do forsake me I will forsake you 2 Chronicles 15 2. Sin is a forsaking of God, and it makes God forsake us. Now which is best, to have God with us or against us? If God is for us it does not matter who is against us Romans 8 31, but if God is against us and departs from us, then all is a chabod 1 Samuel 4 21 and 22. Job 34 29. Furthermore sufferings for God are evidences and tokens of his love, that we are his children and darlings Hebrews 12 64, but sin is a proof that we are not born of God of 1 John 5 18 and 19, but are children of wrath, and heirs of the devil, and hell. Thus the encouragements to suffering, and discouragements to sinning, pronounce sin to be the worst of all evils. 4. Suffering, even for sin, is designed to cure us and kill sin. Surely the remedy is better than the disease. But sin kills us and strengthens sin. They who add sin to sin feed it, give it nourishment and new life and strength. They add fuel to the fire which sufferings are to quench and put out. Affliction is better than going astray, it is good for me that I was afflicted, because before I was afflicted I went astray, Psalm 11967 and 71. The fruit of affliction is the taking away of sin in Isaiah 27 9, it is to make us partakers of his holiness, Hebrews 12 10, which is the end of the greatest promises, 2 Peter 1 4, 2 Corinthians 7 1. We see then that God has the same aim in bringing threatened evils on us as in making good promises and fulfilling them to us. Is this not better than sin? For did sin ever do such kindnesses for us? Alas, its mercies are cruelties, its courtesies are injuries, and its kindnesses are killing. It never did nor meant us any good, unless men are so mad as to think that it is good to be defiled, dishonored, and damned. 5. Sufferings tend to make us perfect, but sin makes us more and more imperfect. The second Adam was perfected by suffering a Hebrews 2.10, but the first Adam was made imperfect by sinning. And thus it fares with both their seeds and children as it did with them. A sinner is without strength a Romans 5 6, without God, without Christ, without hope a Ephesians 2 12. But a sufferer, after a while, shall be perfected by the same God of all grace, as has called him unto eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, 1 Peter 5 10. But the more a sinner, the more imperfect, and the fitter for hell. 6. Suffering for God glorifies God, but sin dishonors God. Suffering calls on us to thank and glorify God for it, 1 Peter 4 14 and 16. By it the saints are happy as God's martyrs of 1 Peter 4 14, but by sinning, sinners are made miserable as the devil's martyrs of 1 Peter 4 15. Which, I pray you, is better. To suffer for God or for the devil. To be suffering saints, or sinners. 7. Sufferings for God, Christ and righteousness add to our glory, but sinning only adds to our torment and Matthew 5 10-12, and 2 Corinthians 4 17. Light afflictions work an exceeding weight of glory, but sin works an exceeding weight of wrath and torment and Romans 2 5. It accumulates heap upon heap, load upon load, to make up a treasury of wrath. Which then is the greater evil, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say a light affliction or heavy sin. Which is better, treasures of glory or treasures of wrath? or, which is all the same, to suffer or to sin. Hitherto I have proved that sin is worse than affliction.
It may be said, however, that if we do not suffer unto death, it is no great suffering, skin for skin, all that a maneth will he give for his life. But if to die is dreadful, it is worse to sin, as I shall now prove. 2. Sin is worse than death. We have a saying, choose the lesser of two evils. Now to die is cheaper, and more easy than to sin. God's loving kindness is better than life, that is, we would do better to part with the latter than the former. In the same way sin is worse than death, it would be better for us to undergo the latter than to commit the former, better submit to death than commit a sin, as I hinted before from Matthew 10 28. Let us compare them. Sin is more deadly than death. Now the separation of soul and body, that dissolution of the frame of nature, and of the union between soul and body is regarded as a great evil, as is apparent from man's unwillingness to die. Man would rather live in sickness and pain, and would be in deaths often, rather than die once. And it is not only an evil in man's apprehension, but it is really so to human nature, for it is called an enemy 1 Corinthians 15 26. It is true that death is a friend to grace, but it is equally true that death is an enemy to nature. There are four ways in which death is evil, and an enemy to man, and in all of them sin is more an enemy to man than is death. 1. Death is separating. It separates the nearest and dearest relations, even that which God has joined together, man and wife, soul and body. It separates us from possessions and ordinances, as I showed before. Thus death is a great evil and enemy. True. But sin is worse, for it brought death, and all the evils that come by death. Sin separates man, while alive, from God, who is the light and life of our lives. Death does not separate from the love of God, which sin does Romans 8 38 and 39, Isaiah 59 2. 2. Death is terrifying. It is the king of terrors at Job 18 14. It is very grim, a very sour and harsh thing. It is ghastly and frightful, for men are not only unwilling, but afraid to die. Yet all the terror that is in death is put there by sin. Sin is the sting of death, 1 Corinthians 15 56, without which, though it kills, it cannot curse or hurt any man. Thus sin is more terrible than death, for without sin either there would have been no death, or for certain no terror in death. When the sting is taken away by the death of Christ, there is no danger or cause of fear Hebrews 2 14 and 15. When the Apostle Paul looked at the Prince of Peace, he was not afraid of the King of Terrors, but to challenge and upbraid it, 1 Corinthians 15 55. 3. Death is killing, but sin much more so. Death deprives of natural and temporal life, but sin deprives us of spiritual and eternal life. Death kills only the body, but sin kills the soul and brings upon it a worse death than the first death, that is, the second death. Men may kill us, but only God can destroy us, that is damn us, and he never does that except for sin. Thus sin is more killing than death is killing. 4. Death is corrupting. It brings the body to corruption, and makes it so loathsome that we say of our dearest relations, as Abraham did of Sarah, when she was dead, bury her out of my sight. Death makes every man say to the worm, Thou art my mother, and to corruption and putrefaction, Thou art my father to Job 17 14. But sin corrupts us more than death, for he who died without sin saw no corruption. It defiles us and makes us stink in the nostrils of God and man at Genesis 34 30. The old man and his lusts are corrupt and do corrupt us at Ephesians 4 22. They corrupt our souls, and that which corrupts the soul, the principal man of the man, is much worse than that which corrupts the body only. Sin, however, corrupts the body too, while it is alive, intemperance and uncleanness corrupt soul and body. So sin is even in this worse than death. Our Saviour tells the Jews that their great misery was not that they should die, but that they should die in their sins at John 8:21. By this he intimated that sin was worse than death, and was that which made death a misery. Better die in a hospital or a ditch than in sin. It is better to die anyhow than to sin and die in sin. Therefore the church father told Eudodia the empress, when she threatened him, nil nisi peccatum timio, I fear nothing but sinning. And that queen spoke royally who said that she would rather hear of her children's death than that they had sinned. They of whom the world was not worthy, being too good to live long, chose rather to die than sin Hebrews 11. 3. Sin is worse than the devil. 
The devil is indeed a terrible enemy, the evil and envious one, the hater of mankind. Yet he knows that he can neither damn nor hurt men without sin. Sin can do, without the devil, that which the devil cannot do without sin, and that is, undo men. God and the devil are not so contrary as God and sin, for the devil has something left which was of God, that is, his being. Sin, however, never was nor can be of God, he is neither the author of it nor the tempter to it, James 1.13. Sin made the devil what he is. For the devil was not made as a devil by God. It is true that the devil now seeks to devour man, that he cannot do it apart from sin, and that he cannot compel any man to sin. 1. Though the devil tempts, it is man who sins. Satan's temptations to sin are not sins, nor are they the way to hell, but the very temptations of sin are sins, and the way to more sins, and so to hell. A man's own lusts are more and worse tempters than the devil. The scripture speaks as if a man were not tempted, nor indeed is he effectually, until his lusts do it to James 1 14. If a man were tempted by the devil forty days, and yet remained without sin as did Christ, if he were tempted all his days, and yielded not because the grace of God was sufficient for him, he might, as Saint Paul did. Glory in his infirmities and triumph over the messenger of Satan as 2 Corinthians 12. The devil gives up for a season, but sinful lusts scarcely ever do so, for they haunt men more than the devil does. The serpent beguiled me and I did eat, was no excuse. The devil had a spite against me and paid it, will not do for an apology. It is man who sins, and sin that damns, neither of which can the devil force upon man. 2. Sin is worse than the devil as a tempter, and it is a worse tormentor. The devil is cruel enough, a roaring lion. Many times he takes possession of men and handles them most unmercifully. And he will torment them much more in hell. But during all this the devil is outside a man's spirit, but sin is there, taking possession of and tormenting that. It is a sorrowful thing to be tempted to sin, but it is a torment to be a sinner. God does more for us, for our ease and refreshment, when he pardons us than if he cast out of us as many devils as he cast out of Mary Magdalene or out of the man called Legion and Mark 5 9. Yeah, in hell the gnawing worm of a guilty and upbraiding conscience torments man more than devils do. It would be a relief to a man in hell if he could only have peace in his conscience, or if he could say that he was there without his fault, and that his perdition were not of himself. 4. Sin is worse than hell. Hell is only a punishment, but sin is a crime. It is more evil than the punishment, and it is that of which hell is the punishment. The very greatness of this punishment argues the greatness of the crime, and the sinfulness of sin. That God is glorified on men in such a way is a clear and foolproof what an evil thing it is to sin against and dishonor God. Consequently hell itself does not inflict so much hurt as sin does. Hell, indeed, is a dismal place of horror and torment, the extremity of suffering, but it never had any existence till sin had. Nor could hell have such names and such torments as it does now if sin were not there. It is reported as a saying of Anselm that if sin and hell were set before him and he must go through one of them, he would choose to go through hell rather than sin. Sin is the worst of hell and worse than hell. It is what makes sinners cry out for the uninhabitableness of devouring fire and everlasting burnings, which are no terror to righteous and upright souls of Isaiah 33 14 and 15. It is sin that makes hell to be hell. God was never angry until sin made him so, his wrath was never kindled except by sin. Now just as sin made hell, so the more sin the more hell, as Tyre and Sidon suffer more than Sodom and Gomorrah. Even if there were no hell but such as Cain and Judas felt within them, it would still be a great one. They would tell you that it is damnation enough to be a sinner and to feel the horrors of a guilty and accusing conscience. 5. In every way sin is the worst of evils. I will show this yet a little more. 1. There is more evil in it than there is good in the whole creation. That is, it does us more hurt than all the creation can do us good. When we are sick or wounded, many of God's creatures of a medicinal nature can help to recover and cure us. There is no cure, however, for this evil of sin by any or all of the creatures. Sin was too much for that good in which we were created, and all created good ever since has not been able to recover us from it. No. It is only by God that we can be either pardoned or purged of it. All the angels in heaven could neither pay our debt for us nor cleanse our hearts for us. 
God himself new makes us, for mere mending would not serve our turn. Therefore man's recovery is called a new creation, and the new man is said to be created in righteousness and true holiness Ephesians 4 24. It was David's prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God Psalm 51. Sin is an evil beyond the skill and power of all the creation to cure and cleanse. 2. There is no evil but sin to be repented of. God allows us to sigh and groan, to mourn and lament for other evils, but for this he calls for and requires repentance. This is a severe thing, full of rebuke and disgrace to man, although it is a grace. How great is that evil for which a man must cry, I have sinned, and to bring him to the confession of which and to repentance for and from it, other evils are inflicted. 3. The greatest punishments are those which are made up of sins. It is worse to be let alone and given up, than if man were sent immediately to hell. As it is, they live only as reserved to fill up their measure to the brim, and to undergo the more of hell, to grow rich in wrath having treasured it up against that day. As the best of comforts is to have assurance of the love of God, and to be sealed to the day of redemption, so the saddest of judgments is to be given up uh, as is said three times in Romans 1 to one's lusts, to a hardened heart, a seared conscience, a reprobate mind. Then God will say, Let him that is filthy be filthy still Revelation 22 11, and they shall not see nor understand, lest they be converted Isaiah 6 9 and 10. This last is a fearful scripture, for it is six times quoted in the New Testament, as you may see in the margin. 4. God hates man for sin. It is not only sin a Proverbs 6 19, but sinners that God hates, and that for sin. It is said of God that he hates the workers of iniquity Psalm 5 5 and not only the works of iniquity, but the workers of it. Hatred is known not by judgments, nor by the evil of suffering, but by the evil of sin which is before us of Ecclesiastes 9 1 and 2. It is because of sin that the merciful God says, He that made them will not have mercy on them, nor show them any favor Isaiah 27 11. As a certain scholar expresses it, this is the highest that can be spoken of the venom of sin, that in a sense, and to speak after the manner of men, it has put hatred into God himself, it has made the Lord hate and destroy his own workmanship. God is love, and judgment is his strange work, yet sin makes him out of love with men and in love with their destruction at last though he does not delight in the death of a sinner who repents, yet he does in the death of one who is impenitent. 5. Christ is the best and the greatest of saviors, and his salvation the best and greatest salvation. This proves sin to be the worst and greatest of evils. He came to save sinners not from the petty evils of sickness, affliction and persecution, but from sin, the greatest of all evils in Matthew 1 21, 1 Timothy 1 15. To be saved from Egypt was of old reckoned great, but being delivered out of the north was a greater salvation at Jeremiah 23 8. Salvation from sin, however, is the greatest salvation of all, and therefore sin is the worst and greatest of evils. Thus we have proved sin to be the worst of evils, the evil of evil, with which nothing is to be compared for evil. I will now apply this in detail, and show what we should infer from the sinfulness of sin as against God, and as against man. 2. Inferences from the sinfulness of sin against God. 1. The patience and long-suffering of God with sinners is wonderful. If sin is so exceedingly sinful, that is, contrary to and displeasing to God, then surely his patience is exceedingly great, his goodness exceedingly rich, and his long-suffering exceedingly marvellous, even such as to cause wonder. That God should entreat sinners, his enemies, to be reconciled 2 Corinthians 5.20, that God should stand at a sinner's door and knock Revelation 3.20, that God should wait on sinners to be gracious to them Isaiah 30.18, is not after the manner of man, but of God. Truly it is a characteristic of the God of grace and patience, and to be admired for ever. It was a wonder that in the beginning God should think thoughts of good and not of evil, of peace and not of wrath, but visit man in the cool of the day. Yet when he had imparted and commended his heart's love to us through his son Romans 5 8 and both were rejected, that he should still continue to offer and call and wait is a miracle of miracles. What shall we say? It is God who is the God of grace and patience Romans 15 5 and rich in both Romans 2 4. 2 Peter 2 3 to 9, 1 Timothy 1 13 to 16. He is as his name is Exodus 34 6, Numbers 14 18, Psalm 86 15, and as he was yesterday, so he is today. We are all living monuments and examples of his goodness and patience. 
It is of the Lord's mercies that all of us are not altogether and utterly consumed, and that in hell are Lamentations 3.22. Sin is so sinful, contrary, and displeasing to God, and has made man so much God's enemy, that it is a miracle that he should find his enemies and let them go away safely. God who is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity looks on the sin of men. His eyes so affect his heart as to grieve him. It tempts and provokes him to anger, wrath and hatred.
and yet God keeps his anger, which is like burning coals in the bosom, he does not let out all his wrath and ease himself of his burden by avenging himself on his adversaries, but he woos and waits on sinners. Such is the power of his patience, the infiniteness of his mercy and compassion, and the riches of his unsearchable grace. God sees sin. He is not ignorant. God is sensible of it and concerned, for it grieves and vexes him. God is able to avenge himself when he pleases, yet he forbears and is patient. Wonder at it. And consider further. 1. The multitude of sinners in the world. If it were only one or two, they might be winked at and passed by. But all the world lies in wickedness, 1 John 5 19. There is none righteous, no, not one if there had been only ten, God would have spared Sodom although ten thousand sinners might be there. Yet there is not a man to be found who does not sin. All have sinned, Jew and Gentile, high and low. What grace, then, what patience is this? 2. The multitude of sins committed by every sinner. The sins are more numerous than the sinners. If all men had sinned only once it would have mitigated the matter. Sin, however, has grown up with men. Not a good thought is to be found in their hearts, Genesis 6 5. Sin grows up faster than men do, they are old in sin when still young in years. They are adding iniquity to iniquity, and drawing it on with cords and ropes, committing it with both hands greedily, as if they could not sin enough. They dare God himself to judge them. They drink down iniquity like water, as if it was their element and nourishment and pleasure also. Yet, behold, how miraculously patient and long-suffering is God. 3. The length of time. This multitude of sinners has committed these multitudes of sins from the beginning even until now, generation after generation. If all the world had sinned and committed all kinds of sins, yet only for an hour or a day, it would not have been so provoking. But as length of times aggravates misery, so it does sin. God reckons up 120 years of patience and there were many before that as to the old world of Genesis 6-3, and to Israel, 40 years a Hebrews 3-17. He came to the fig tree of the Jewish nation three years in person, seeking fruit before he cut it down, or so much as gave the order for it to Luke 13-6 and 7. He had waited much longer with all of these, but these years were, as it were, borrowed time, such as landlords allow their tenants after quarter day, space given before sending in the bailiffs. We were quite old enough to be damned when we were young, but God has given us an overplus of time, space for repentance, and has not yet cut us down as those who cumber the ground. Such is his patience. 4. Sins cry to God against us. Moreover, the devil for sure is constantly pleading against us. The cry of Cain's sin went up at Genesis 4.10. The cry of Sodom's sin was great at Genesis 18.20 and 21 and 19.13. The keeping back of laborers wages cries a James 5 4 indeed, all oppression cries Habakkuk 1 2, and 12 to 17. Yet God, as if he were loath to judge us or to believe reports against us, comes down to see if these things are so, and, as it were, sets Abraham and his friends interceding, by telling them what he is about to do, Amos 3 7. Such is the goodness of God L. 5. Many aggravating circumstances attend the sins of men. In addition to the greatness of sin's own nature, these greatly provoke God. Men's sins are not only many and great, they are both multiplied and magnified, aggravated by many circumstances. Men increase and heighten their sin by not repenting of it, and aggravate their impenitence by despising the goodness of God which should lead them to repentance of Romans 2 4. This makes them inexcusable and incapable of escaping the judgment of God. Men sin against deliverances, as if they were delivered to do all manner of abominations, and to sin more than before Jeremiah 7 8-10. Men sin against their resolutions and promises, vows and protestations, made on sea or land, on sickbeds or at any times of danger, and return like dogs to their vomit. They bargain with God in time of fear and danger, but put him off with nothing when the danger is, as they think, over. Men sin against means, and the means of grace. They have precept on precept, line on line, and yet sin still and more. Whatever way God takes with them, nothing will suit them. God says, This and this have I done, yet you have not returned in Amos 4 6 to 11. Mourn or pipe to them, it is all the same, they will not hearken. 
and, what is more, men sin against knowledge and conscience. Though they know God, they glorify him not as God Romans 1 21. They know their master's will, but fail to do it to Luke 12 47, James 4 17. It would be useless, because impossible, to count all the aggravating circumstances of men's sins, which make them more sins, the degree, multitude, and magnitude. Yet notwithstanding all this, God waits to be gracious. Oh, grace, grace unto it. Is it not a wonder that men are spared, especially if we consider how quickly God cast away the angels that sinned? Wonder of grace. 2. The judgments of God are just. Though God is so patient, beyond what we could ask or think, yet sometimes he does, and will forever, punish sinners who do not repent. Thus this is a second inference from the sinfulness of sin. God often punishes less than iniquity deserves, but never more. The greatest sufferings are neither more nor less than sin deserves. The worst on this side of hell is mercy, and the worst of and in hell is but justice. 1. Consider the nature of God. He is and cannot but be just shall not the God and judge of all the earth do right. Can he or will he do wrong? No. For he will not lay upon man more than right, that he should enter into judgment with God. Job 34 23. Cain could say that his punishment was intolerable, but he could not say that it was unjust, though greater than he could bear, yet it was not greater than he deserved. God will not argue the case with men merely as a sovereign, but as a judge, who proceeds not by will only, but by rule. Repeatedly, when the judgments of God are spoken of in Revelation, they are said always to be just and true and righteous in Revelation 15.3 and 16.7. Though his ways are unsearchable, yet they are true and just and righteous. He makes war in righteousness. Death is only the due wages of sin in Romans 6.23. Therefore it is said, their damnation is just a Romans 3.8 and every sin has a just recompense of reward Hebrews 2.2. Guilt stops men's mouths when they suffer the judgment of God. Lamentations 3:39, Romans 3:19, Psalm 51:4, Romans 3:4. If God judges man, God is found true, but if man judges God, man is found a liar. Would we complain of the devil, as Eve did? It is true that he is to blame, but he is not so much the cause of man's sin as man himself is. The devil certainly could tempt, but he could not compel. So it is man who sins although he is tempted to sin, though man could not prevent himself being tempted, he could have refrained from sinning. Would we complain of God? What would we charge him with? Did not God make man in the best state in which a creature could be? Did not God tell him what was evil, and the danger of sinning? God might say as he did of Israel, what could I have done more that I have not done? So man must say that he has rewarded evil to himself by doing evil, and that his perdition is of himself, Hosea 13 9. Sinners have their option and choice, why then do they complain? 2. Consider the nature of sin. It is deicide, God murder. Thus it is just for God to do with sinners what they would unjustly do with him, that is, take away from them all good and glory, displease and destroy them, because they would do so to him. If we consider the person who is sinned against, and that the aim of sin is to ungod God, what punishment can be thought bad enough? The schools rightly tell us that objectively sin is infinite. What punishment then can be too great for so great an evil? If its deed had answered its intention, and will horror of horrors, God would have been no more. As none but infinite power can pardon it, so none but infinite power can punish it sufficiently. Just as its aim is infinite, so is its desert. Therefore, though its punishment is also infinite, it is but just seeing sin contains all evil, it is not strange that its punishment should be answerable and proportionate. That all sin should undergo all misery is not unjust, God renders sufferings to man only according to his doings, Jeremiah 17 10. 3. Consider the impenitent state in which sinners die. Thereby they treasure up this wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God in Romans 2 5. They who die impenitent continue as they die, consequently they sin, and are impenitent for ever. Is it unreasonable that everlasting sinning should be everlastingly punished? It is no severity in God to damn such men for ever. Let man repair the injury he has done, and pay the debt he owes God to the utmost farthing, and he shall go free. If he says he cannot, 
that is his crime as well as his misery, for he chose whether or not to do the injury, and to run into this debt. Besides, he cannot plead the satisfaction made by Christ, for he made no satisfaction for final unbelief and impenitence, a man who never accepts Christ on the terms of the gospel cannot plead Christ's name or righteousness before God, and there is no salvation in any other. Thus on all accounts sin's sinfulness vindicates the justice and judgments of God. But though God's judgment is just, yet he is pleased to pardon and forgive some sinners, which brings me to my third inference. 3. How precious a mercy is the forgiveness of sin. It is a wonder that anyone is pardoned. The preciousness of this mercy, in the forgiveness of sins, may be seen in various ways. 1. It is a new covenant mercy. The new covenant is called a better covenant, and its promises better promises a Hebrews 8 6. The old covenant, that of works, granted no pardon, but this is the mercy of the new covenant, that it is a covenant of grace a Hebrews 8:12. 2. Forgiveness of sins is the fruit of the precious blood of Christ his blood was shed for this end. Now that which costs so great a price must needs be precious. We were redeemed with no less than blood, and no worse blood than that of the Lamb, and Son of God of 1 Peter 1 18. This redemption is called forgiveness of sins of Ephesians 1 7, Colossians 1 14. 3. By forgiveness of sins we have the knowledge of salvation and Luke 1 77. They who have their sins remitted are blessed, and they shall be blessed a Romans 4 8. 4. By the forgiveness of sins we have ease and rest for our souls, and cause to be of good cheer. The sense of pardon will take away the sense of pain. What? Are you sick when pardoned? No. I am no more sick of Isaiah 33 24. When sin is taken away, the sickness which remains is as nothing. The sense of sin makes us sick, but the sense of pardon makes us well. We can say, like the psalmist, return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Psalm 116 7. A man who is sensible of sin and not of pardon can hardly sleep or take any rest, but when the joyful sound of a pardon is proclaimed and received, the soul which is justified by faith has peace with God and within itself, and is at rest though the man sick of the palsy was not cured. He had good cause to be of good cheer, because his sins were forgiven him in Matthew 9 2. This is called speaking comfortably, or to the heart, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished. Is that all? No. But, which is more, tell her that her iniquity is pardoned, Isaiah 41 and 2. It is a greater comfort to hear that our sins are pardoned than that our afflictions are at an end. It makes us able as well as willing to undergo afflictions, sufferings and persecutions. Now if we consider what a sinful thing sin is against God, how displeasing to him, it is a wonderful thing that God should pardon any man's sin. God does more than man can do for himself or expect that God should do for him. Indeed, it costs God more, witness the blood of Christ, and requires more of his power than to heal all our diseases, and bestow all the good of this world upon us. Our Saviour tells us that it is easier to say to an impotent man, Arise, take up thy bed and walk, than to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee. The latter is a declaration of his power in Matthew 9 5. When Moses prays that Israel might be pardoned their sin, he says, Let the power of the Lord be great in Numbers 14 17 to 19. It is called riches of mercy and great love for Ephesians 2 4. It is such power as that by which Christ was and we are raised from the dead of Colossians 2 13, Ephesians 1 19 and 20. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity? Micah 7 18. This is the mystery into which angels pry, and at which they wonder 1 Peter 1 12. God, as it were, acts against his own word in Genesis 2 17, he revokes his threatening. It is more than we could ask or think, it is beyond our reach, as it is expressed in scripture Isaiah 55 7-9. When men are sensible of sin they can hardly believe that God will or can forgive it, they are apt to say as Cain did, our iniquity is greater than can be forgiven. Man's mercy is large when it reaches to seven times, what is God's then that reaches to more than seventy times seven in a day? Matthew 18.21 When good men have prayed concerning the ungodly, Lord, forgive them not to Isaiah 2.9, Jeremiah 18.23, yet God has pardoned, even when he himself was so put to it as to say, how shall I pardon thee for this? Jeremiah 5.7 
Yet God offers pardon and teaches men what to say to him in such cases that they may be forgiven Hosea 14 1 4. 4. Sin is not to be committed on any account whatsoever. It is not to be committed for any reason.